Let's turn tonight to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I'm going to read the entire chapter tonight, uh, and then we'll uh, settle in on one verse of Scripture as our text verse. Uh, but then we will be uh, turning to two other passages of Scripture uh, in the New Testament. We'll be turning to the book of Philemon and then the book of Colossians. But I'll give you instructions when we'll be going there. Uh, we're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And as I mentioned Sunday, and I've already mentioned tonight, uh, that I'm going to start this new series. It's, it's, it's going to last anywhere from uh, 8 to 12, 13 uh, different lessons that I have. And uh, we'll just see how far we go with this. But uh, I've entitled this series, uh, Ministry Companions. And we're going to take uh, some individuals that Paul, the Apostle Paul, mentions uh, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 as he comes to the end of his life. And uh, they are companions that he was with in the ministry. Uh, now, I, you, th you think about this. Uh, we, as members of the Emmanuel Baptist Church, we serve in ministry together. Uh, we are ministry companions. We are serving the Lord together. Uh, we, as the church, we're trying to fulfill the commission of the church, which is to reach the world with the gospel. And so we are, we are at work together. And uh, everything that goes on in, in, in our church, uh, it, takes a, it takes a team to do it. Even tonight, as we have church, there, there are some who did different duties and responsibilities so that uh, we could have church tonight. And so uh, I'm thankful for that. So we are working together. And as we uh, serve the Lord together, together, uh, there are certain uh, things that I want us to be reminded of, uh, some things that we will face, um, some things that, uh, some characters that uh, we don't want to be, some characters that we want to be, and I think there's much to learn, uh, and you're going to be surprised at uh, what an in-depth study of these verses that are just seemingly a list of names uh, about how much there is to learn about these characters, and so uh, I'm, ex I'm excited about this. I wish I could give them all to you tonight, but you don't seem as excited about that as I am to give them to you tonight, and so we're just going to get to one uh, this evening, but uh, follow along with me, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I'll read the entire uh, chapter tonight, uh, verse 1. Uh, actually, I'll just read down because of time. Uh, I'll read down through uh, verse number 11. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now let me remind you that the Apostle Paul is writing Timothy. He's writing to Timothy, his son in the faith. He's uh, spent the, the, the first letter, and now in the second letter to Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy, he's giving a lot of instructions uh, of what he is to do, and he's reminding him of some things in chapter number 4 as he's getting close to his death. Now notice verse number 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's speaking, of course, of departing from this life to the next. Uh, he's not depart he's speaking of departing from prison. Uh, verse number 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What an important verse of Scripture there. And uh, certainly in a, in a, in something that we're very aware of. Verse 8, Henceforth, it, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now bear in mind, the Apostle Paul is in prison. Uh, he, now we find, he, he's mentioned, I charge thee therefore before God, getting some things to remember, uh, that in those perilous times, that's what people are going to be looking for, but you just need to preach the word. He tells him the gravity of his state. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's life is going to be taken from him. He is sitting in a prison. He talks, he's fought a good fight. There's a crown laid up for him. But then he says in verse number 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Paul was a great Christian. God used Paul in, in a miraculous, phenomenal way. Um, 
what what a what a what a what a what a man that that God used and how God used his life. We sit here tonight, and the gospel coming to us, and literally we can trace it back uh, all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ, but to the Apostle Paul, that missionary to the Gentiles, and uh, God used him. As, but he he's human like we are. I'm certain it comes to his end of his life. There were people he wanted to see. There were he didn't want to be by himself. Um, he was ready. And I believe there's ever a man that was ready to, to he, he said, I'd finished my course, I'm ready to go. But he's still human, and I'm, I'm certain as he was getting in his last days, there are things going through his mind, and there are people that he wanted to see. And he is, now he's ready to, do that, to Timothy, do that diligence to come shortly unto me. Timothy, I want you to come see me. Timothy, do that diligence. Uh, make it a priority. Get here as fast as you can. We're going to read verse 10 in just a moment. And from verse 10 all the way down to the end of the chapter, the Apostle Paul is going to mention many people. Most people that he mentions is by name. There are some groups of people he alludes to. We're going to take each one of these individuals that are mentioned. We're also going to take uh, some generalities through, not all tonight, but through the, these Wednesday nights. Uh, but he's going to mention many people. Remember, he's mentioning these ministry, all these are ministry companions. As he comes to the end of his life and he's saying, my time is ab I'm about to depart. Timothy, come to me. Verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken thee, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable me for the ministry. I'm going to stop reading there. We're going to continue. He's going to name all these individuals. He's even going to name those who try to do evil to him. He's going to mention those that have fled and forsook him. He's going to mention a lot. But tonight I want us to look at that first character, for Demas hath forsaken me. Paul, I'm about to depart. Come to me. Make diligently make the effort to come to me. I want to see you. For Demas hath forsaken me. Only Luke is with me. Demas had been with him. He says, Timothy, he's not with me anymore. Luke is with me, but Demas isn't with me anymore. And tonight I want to speak on that first character, that first ministry companion, Demas the deserter. Demas the deserter. I want you to stay with me tonight. I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to look at two other passages of Scripture. I'm going to give you about 45 minutes worth of introduction in about four or five minutes. Uh, and then there's several things that I want us to see uh, in, 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 in this, this individual, Demas the deserter. Father, I pray that you'll help us tonight as we uh, look at the Word of God. May uh, our faith be strengthened by what we see. May our resolve uh, be even stronger by what we uh, here tonight. And uh, Father, may we not just look at this one who forsook, but may we look at the, uh, the one who stood all the way to his death and uh, how they affected each other. And Father, may we determine, uh, may the lesson tonight help us to determine to be faithful to you uh, until the time you call us home. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we see, and this is the, the well-known passage of Scripture where we hear the word Demas. Uh, this man, Demas, is mentioned three times in Scripture. We're going to look at the other two in just a moment. But this is the one that we think of. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Now, hold your spot there, but turn with me to the book of Philemon. Uh, just a few pages towards the uh, back of your Bible. Uh, we have the book Titus, then the book Philemon. In the uh, book of Philemon, Paul, of course, uh, is the author of this book as well. In verses 23 through 25, he mentions several people. Uh, these salute, there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, what's the next word? Demas, Lucas, or Luke, my fellow laborers. Now, it's interesting to me that in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, as he's coming to the end of his life, he says, Demas hath forsaken me. Then he mentions, only Luke is with me. 
Then if we, we find in the book of Philemon uh, that these were with Paul, not just Demas, but Luke again. So we, we think of the, the, the Luke, the disciple, Luke, the apostle, uh, Luke, that doctor, Luke, that, that, that author of the gospel of Luke who traveled with the Lord. Uh, okay, we, we know that he, we expect him to be faithful, but we find Demas again with Paul where we find Luke. Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of quick information... You find Mark, the, Apo- the Apostle Mark, and you find Luke. These are very prominent uh, New Testament Bible characters. Aristarchus was a Thessalonian who accompanied Paul in his third missionary journey. Uh, he was a faithful companion. So it brings us to conclusion that this uh, Demas mentioned there was also a faithful companion. He was also trusted by the Apostle Paul. Turn with me uh, to the book of Colossians, if you would. Colossians chapter number 4. Colossians chapter number 4. If you just go back in order, you have 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, then 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and the book of Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter number 4. And uh, we find as uh, Paul comes to the end of this letter, in verse number 14, he writes... Of, of Colossians chapter number 4, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Here, Demas is mentioned again. Now, if Demas was not a faithful companion, I don't think he'd be mentioned with Luke. I don't think he'd be mentioned in this connotation of uh, they, they are greeting you. They are saying, uh, the, these Christians are saying hello to you as fellow Christians. Now, uh, Put that in context Context with 2 Timothy chapter number 4, when he says, only Luke is with me. I, find, I found it interesting in my study, and what, I, what, I, what I've shown you so far, is that every time Demas is mentioned, Luke is mentioned. Luke, the apostle. Luke, the author of the book of Acts. The author of the gospel of Luke. A faithful companion. He's still with Paul. We'll look at him, Lord willing, next week. But Demas is mentioned in the same breath. In the same connotation before we find him in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 as the deserter. You say, Pastor, uh, there's some things that are obvious to me, but, 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 but uh, it, it is interesting that, that Demas was a faithful companion. But what do we remember about Demas? We remember him as a deserter. We remember him as the forsaker. We have to be reminded that he was faithful with the Apostle Paul. Paul, as I've already mentioned, was in prison facing a death sentence. Uh, This was a difficult time. He was ready, but still. He was flesh and blood, no doubt. He was preparing for for death. He's going to mention some individuals who meant a lot to him, who had been a big part of his life. We find in two separate instances, I don't have time to go into the whole the, the historical context and the scriptural uh, story of the book of Philemon, but that's an event that took place in the life of Paul that Demas was part of. The, to the Colossians, to those Christians, uh, that, that letter to them, we find who is a companion of the Apostle Paul. It's Demas. And now as Paul comes to the end of his life and he bids Timothy to come, he says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, Paul did not just say um, he left. No doubt because Demas had been with him in his, in his travels, his journeys, in his ministry. He had ministered with him. He had served with him. I think it is safe to assume that Paul was still counting on him as Paul comes to the end of his life. Let me just insert here for all of us tonight in the building and watching uh, on the live stream tonight. Uh, When you serve in ministry, people count on you. And you serving in ministry, it's true, you're counting on someone else. One of the great things about the Emmanuel Baptist Church is you have people you can count on. But can you be counted on? And at one time, Demas could be counted on, and Paul did not just say he got weary and well-doing. 
Paul did not just say he, he left and I don't know where he went. Paul said, for Demoth hath forsaken me. Forsake is a very strong word. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines this word as to quit or leave entirely, to desert, to abandon, to depart from. Friends and flatterers forsake us in adversity, to abandon, to renounce, to reject, to leave, to withdraw from, to fail. What the Bible is saying, what Paul is saying is, Demoth left me entirely. He deserted. He abandoned me. Wow, he's in prison. He's going to have his life taken. He abandoned me. He renounced. He rejected. It is sad, but it is, a, it is something to remind us of that Demas is going to be forever remembered by 2 Timothy chapter number 4, not by his mention in the book of Philemon. And that leads me to what I'm, uh, the, the, the points I want to make tonight, and I have seven of them, and I'll move through them in a, in a timely manner so that, so that we're not here all night. But let me say, number one, Demas had been a faithful servant. I've already mentioned that in the introdu introduction. But he had been a faithful servant. Uh, when I think of betrayal in the Bible, I automatically think of Judas. You probably do too. Judas betrayed Christ. The Scripture tells us Judas did not know Christ, did not accept Him. Uh, that was the greatest betrayal of all time. But certainly, Demas betrayed the Apostle Paul. He deserted him. But at one time, he had been faithful. He had been a companion. He had been right there with the Apostle Paul. Now, that can speak to us tonight as, I don't want to serve with somebody today and then desert them when, they're, when they need me. I don't want to be serving with someone today and the difficult time comes in their life and I cannot wait. I'm, I'm going to, I've determined I'm going to go in order, but I cannot wait to get a few verses down when Paul said, no man stood with me. I can't wait to teach that lesson. But I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the deserter. I don't want to be the forsaker. You say, I would never do that. Be careful. We're going to see some other things in here that should speak to us to get our attention. At one time, if we put this in the day's context, one time Demas was door knocking with Paul. At one time, Demas was at the work night. At one time, Demas was at the prayer meeting. At one time, Demas was ushering. At one time, Demas was teaching Sunday school. Demas was driving a church bus. At one time, Demas was in the difficult times, in the heat of spiritual warfare, in the heat of ministry with the Apostle Paul. We know the life of the Apostle Paul. The chapter before, he says, I've lived a fully known life. I've been trans you see, you've seen my life. Paul's not going to let somebody unfaithful minister with him to that degree. Number one, if they're not faithful, the conviction would have been there. Luke, the faithful friend. He, Demas, and Paul. At one time, Demas had been faithful. That's the first observation I want us to see. And I want to remind us we have a responsibility to be faithful. Uh, we have a responsibility to serve. We have a responsibility to, and it's an opportunity we have to serve with people. What, what, a, what an honor to, to serve the Lord, first of all. But then the Lord would allow Demas to serve with the Apostle Paul. No doubt. And we're going to see this ne next week or with Luke. Luke was there. If I can say it like this, to help hold up the hands. Luke was great in his own right. but He was there to help hold up the, the hands of the Apostle Paul. What an honor. God allows us to serve with people and to help the cause of Christ. But one time he was faithful. Number two, many Christians are stable for a season but cannot endure to the end. 
Many Christians are stable for a season but cannot endure to the end. I've seen many Christians serve alongside pastors and we call Christian leadership for a long season of time only to forsake them later. There's not a pastor who's ever pastored longer than a minute who couldn't testify. And I don't think can understand to the degree probably that Paul understood, but can understand how somebody serves with you in ministry, and they're there with you, and you can count on them, and you can depend on them, and you shed tears together, you shed blood together, you, you laugh together, you cry together, you have victories together, you see God do miracles, and then one day they're just gone. It's important that you and I maintain the right foundation in our life. And, it, and by the way, this whole COVID situation has been good from one respect. It's forced us to put all of our focus on our personal relationship with God and not be real busy. And I like being busy in the work, but the work cannot replace our dedication to the Lord, our relationship with God. Many Christians are stable for a season, but cannot endure for the end. You could con contrast Demas with the words Paul just said just a few verses before. I have finished. Let me just say, there's some of you I see you tonight, and you just stand upright in the race as an accomplishment. Just finish. Finish. I, I, I'm not as old as I, I hope to be one day, but I'm old enough to look back on... Now, whether the younger man and the older I get, the more my goals and my priorities change. And the older I get, the more just like, I just want to finish. I don't want to fall by the wayside. I don't want to stumble and fall. I just want to be faithful. And the greatest, and you've got to remember what, what the Bible says about a faithful man. God blesses faithfulness. Faithfulness gets the attention of God. Not performance. Faithfulness. And we have to be faithful until the end. And that ought to be our goal. Don't make it your goal that I want to shine in this situation or, or I even have to participate in this ministry. Make it your goal to finish. Many Christians are stable for a season but cannot endure to the end. You know, sometimes it's easy to be around. You, you think Paul had any trouble attracting somebody that wanted to see what was going on? Anybody with just a shallow appetite for God would want to be around the Apostle Paul. The things that God did through that man, the boldness that that man had. Man, I'd have loved to have seen him on Mars Hill. I mean, where Paul was, something's happening. Well, you see that take place in a church and, man, God's blessing and there's excitement and there's things going on and, and oh, uh, God is just doing something, and, and it, it attracts. But you've got to determine that when the excitement isn't what it always has been, you're not going to be an unst unstable Christian. You're going to finish until the end. I, I believe that, that we in our churches and, and we as Christian parents and, 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 and Christian you know, and, and pastors and Christian leadership, we need to make sure that when we admonish that next generation to go and do something for the Lord, that we put the priority on being faithful. Being faithful. You fulfill the call that God's placed on you, but you be faithful. Mom and dad, you be faithful. Sunday school teacher, you be faithful. Usher, you be faithful. Uh, in, in our daily walk with God, we be faithful. Um, many Christians are stable for a season, but cannot endure to the end. Uh, it's a big deal for you to make it a year. How about five? How about ten? How about twenty? How about thirty? Or how about when they wheel the casket in? It's going to be a shame where there's Christians who for decades helped build a work of God and they won't even have the funeral in the place they helped build. Because they forsook. Because they did not stay to the end. Number three, 
people often forsake another at the most inconvenient time. You know, it's not on the mountaintop when they desert. You know, and this would help us in our friendship. Uh, everybody has friends when they're on the mountains. How about when they're in the valley? People often forsake another the most inconvenient time. I dare say, and you read the life of Paul, you read through the book of Acts, you read, you, you read, read what Paul writes and his imprisonments and his beatings and his tortures and his shipwrecks. There's been many times in his life when he needed somebody to be there to help him. And Christian, whether you're the pastor or, 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 or you're the newest member in church, you're going to, at a time in your life, you're going to need somebody to help you in ministry, to stand with you and to, to, to encourage you and, and work with you. We all need that. So there's been times in Paul's life that he had to have somebody else with him. And there were desperate times. But I don't know if there was ever a time like this time when he needed Demas to be there standing with him. The most inconvenient times. Sometimes you'll, people will fight battles and then they desert them. At another time in their life. Let me say number four. Demas is remembered for, for forsaking Paul. As I had you turn to a couple of different passages where we read about Demas and Luke. I enjoyed peeking above the pulpit and watching some of you with a surprised look on your face. That Demas is actually mentioned in some other passage of scripture than in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And the fact that he's mentioned with Luke. Why is that? It's not that you haven't read it before. It's that Demas is remembered as the deserter. He's remembered as the one who forsook. We don't know. We know that there were times when he was serving faithfully with Paul. I'm certain there is positive that he did. I'm certain there's probably great works that he did. He's diligently served with Paul and Luke and to other times Mark and others. But we remember him for nothing. Positive that he did. He's remembered for forsaking Paul. Christian, let me encourage you tonight. Do not allow your legacy to be an end of forsaking the Lord's work. I've heard this through the years by Demas's. Well, for however many years I was there and I was faithful and I, and I did this and, and there, there, there were things that I, was, that, that I did for the Lord and, and, and all anybody wants to talk about is I'm not there anymore. Fair or not, that's the reality of it. Uh, let me give you a historical illustration. You hear the name Benedict Arnold? If you don't know history, Benedict Arnold was one of the most gifted generals of that time period. There are battles that were won for our nation at the hand of Benedict Arnold. But is he remembered for that? Well, absolutely not. Demas is simply remembered for forsaking Paul. Do not allow this to be your legacy. We're going to talk about John Mark later in these weeks. But I'll remind you that even Paul bid for him to bring him. But Demas, Timothy, be diligent in coming. Because Demas hath forsaken me. Don't let it be your legacy. Number five. Paul was not trying to hurt Demas. Some may think that as Paul comes to the end of his life, he's like, oh, he's letting everybody know. What Demas has done. That's not why he's mentioned at all. I believe, of course, he's mentioned because God wanted this preserved so that you and I can learn from it. Paul was not clearing the air. Paul was not getting his pound of flesh. Paul was not getting anything off of his chest. He was urging Timothy to come and he was telling Timothy that Demas forsook him to help Timothy understand how important it was for Timothy to come to Paul. 
Timothy, listen, listen to the words of the, of the Scripture. Timothy, be diligent in, in coming. For Demas hath forsaken me. Only Luke is with me. Timothy, I fought a good fight. My time of departure is at hand. Come diligently because I've been forsaken. I need you. He was not trying to hurt Demas. He was trying to get Timothy to understand how important it was for him to come to Paul. Let me just say this will help you, help your church, and help your pastor. And when somebody forsakes, that's a good time for somebody else to step up. If we'd spend less time talking about brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so who's not here anymore and more time saying, I'm going to step up. That's, that's the connotation that Paul is writing this. Paul was not a vindictive man. Of course, he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so he's writing what the Holy Spirit's telling him to write. But he was not trying to mark him. He was trying to let Timothy know, come. Timothy knew who Demas was. Timothy knew that Demas had been there with Paul. Now Paul, my mentor, my father in the faith, the one who I've looked to for instruction and direction, he, he's going to leave this world. He, he, he needs me. And here's some urgency. I've been forsaken by Demas. And that's why in, in, I'll take that point a little further. Not that some have forsaken, but some, it's, it's what you've got to understand. If there's a void, fill it. You know, we have too many, and this is, to, this, is, this is, to me, this is the best church on the face of God's earth. I wouldn't trade four churches for this church. So I know who I'm preaching to tonight. We don't need to sit and talk about how so-and-so can't do what anymore, so-and-so's not doing anything. Well, quit talking about step up and do it. Pastor, I want to let you know the trash needs to be taken out. It took you more energy to find me and tell me that than to actually take out the trash. I mention that because nobody has told me that, but you can make that analogy to whatever. Pastor, it sure would be nice if we had people to do this, 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 and this, and I'm sitting there thinking, what's your schedule like? That's why some of you never come to me and tell me needs, because... (laughs) But think about it. And... And some of you have already approached tonight, and I have a long list from the younger generations that I'm coming to say, let's step up. Not that anybody's forsaken, but there's a void that needs, but certainly this is the connotation. He was not trying to hurt Demas, but the work must go on. Paul, the servant of Christ, I, I, I need you. It was not a selfish request for Paul. Because truth of the matter is, and we can take the application as a church, as a called out assembly, as a body that God has assembled together, as we reach others with the gospel, we're dependent on one another. And there's going to be times, and there has been times, when membership of our church needs, and we have to, we, we rush to them in prayer. In friendship. But that doesn't mean that the pastor is exempt from that either. We all need, need, need others to stand with us. But he wasn't trying to hurt Demas. Number six. That, that was a, I like that point. That's a good point. Number six. Paul's statement was not one of pride, but one of fact. Notice what he says. For Demas hath forsaken me. Well, shouldn't he have just been following God? Those statements are made by people who aren't following God. Shouldn't he have just been following the Lord? Well, duh. But it was a state it wasn't a statement of pride, and and I'm gonna get to on one of these Sunday nights. You know, tearing down a monument is not new. There's landmarks 
There's paths. There's traditions. There's great men. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. And those that would attack and twist these things, it's not a statement of pride, but a fact. Demas was there in the book of Philemon. Demas was there in the book of Colossians. I bet there was probably some times Demas was there when brothers and sisters in Christ opened up their home and he got to see the benefit of that. He was there and received some blessings that just kind of the overflow of Paul's life. Because let me tell you, God blessed Paul. God empowered Paul. He was there in all of that. And Demas had a ministry of working with Paul and now had forsaken him. Some would consider this to be prideful. It is not. For example, it is not wrong for a pastor to expect his people to stand by his side in ministry. That's not wrong. And we, we know this and we've lived this. Hey, we're relocating. Who's going with me? Ah, oh, we're with you, Pastor. Hey, let's do it again. Ah, oh, I have an announcement I want to make tonight. <laughs> I'm happy right where I'm at. It's not a statement of pride. It's actually, don't miss this, it's a statement of humility. I need Demas. I need Luke. A church needs their pastor. The pastor needs the church. We need one another. A lot of times the past, and I just I know and I like teaching on these things when they're not an issue. But members like for the pastor to be there for them. The pastor likes for members to be there for them too. You like to call in your Sunday school teacher, but your Sunday school teacher may need you. There are people who have influenced you, and you're, you thank God. And you give, if I let you give testimony tonight, you'd say, Oh, I thank God that brother so-and-so was there at that time of my life, or sister so-and-so was there in my life. I thank God they knocked on my door and invited me and never gave up on me. Well, the time may come, and it is not a matter of, as a matter of fact, it's Bible for us to be able to depend on another. Um, it ties in with a word that has been turned into a dirty word, and it's not anything but a Bible principle, and that's the word loyalty. It was not wrong for Paul to feel that they had forsaken him when he needs them most. God wants loyalty from his people. When you are disloyal to his servant, you are disloyal to God. And some, some people don't like this teaching, but it's, again, it's Bible. You know, that's why you can, you know, I'm not going to say I'm a fan of it, but I don't sit around on Sunday afternoon and wonder who's talking, who was in the service and didn't like what I preached and was talking about me. I don't, I don't, I take a pretty hard nap on Sunday afternoons. That lets you know how much I'm thinking about it. But let me tell you, tell you who is taking note of it. God's taking note of it. And if God put us together as a people, and God leads this church and how he leads is through his man. And he expects the people to follow. We should be loyal to one another. I know this is unpopular teaching, but it's, it's, it's right teaching. Paul's statement was not one of pride, but of fact. Paul did say, follow me as I follow Christ. 
And I think that application would still apply today. Number seven. But this point is two pages long, so don't get too excited. Let's look at the reason for Demas's desertion. We won't turn to it, but write this text down. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 10 says, For Demoth hath forsaken me, but Paul tells us why. It was not because Paul's leadership was too demanding. It was not because Paul's leadership uh, was too old school. It was not because there's too big of a price to pay. It was not because that somebody was bruised or got their feelings hurt or, or the things that some like to say. The Bible says, having loved this present world. Dr. Jack Howes made many quotable statements. One of the, the, the most revealing ones is this. People don't leave truth for error. They leave truth for sin. Error does not entice somebody to leave the truth. It's, it's a very, we're going to look at this on Sunday nights out of Romans chapter number 1. It is a very strong thing for somebody to leave the truth and embrace error. It's sin tied to it. And we live in a day when everybody's a victim of everything. And we want to blame all of our problems on somebody who tells us no. We want to blame all of our problems on a mom and dad who rear us, try and rear us according to this book. We want to blame all of our problems on a church like this church who preaches the Word of God. We want to blame all of our problems on, on a pastor who'll say, if you go out to this world, it will chew you up and spit you out. And when we rebel against that, and they go out in this world, and it chews them up and spits them out, it's still the pastor's fault. Well, I left because there's no love. I left, I left church because it's a man-made system. I left church because it's, it's legalism. And again, when somebody says that, say, define it. Well, you know, okay. Get this point. Demons have forsaken me, having loved this present world. We just read in 1 John chapter 2, 15-17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God loved the world for the purpose of redeeming it to himself. That's a different kind of love. We are to love the world as God loved the world, not as Demas did. I'm to love the world so that I can preach the message of salvation. And I can preach for an hour on that passage right there about these emergent type churches that turn grace into lasciviousness by, by we love you because we're not going to condemn you. Well, the Word of God is what does the condemning. Let me help you. The Word of God condemns me. The Word of God condemns my sin just like it did all of mankind. And it is love to tell a lost man that he needs Christ or he's going to die and go to hell. It is love. I'm, that's the kind of love I'm supposed to have, the same love that God had. And I preached about this not too long ago, how we're not wrestle against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is not our enemy. You put these two things together. If I love them as God loves them, I don't have to like their decisions. I don't have to like their politics. I don't like to have like what they're doing. But I ought to have God's love, which means I want to try and win them with the gospel. So if it means I don't say all of my political persuasions so that I have an opportunity to win them, then I'm going to do it. If it means that I have to take a little bit, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I should have the same love so that I can win them. This is not the same kind of love that Demas had for the world. Demas forsook Paul because he had become enamored by the things of this world. I'm going to read most of this because of time. 
the temporal had become more important than the eternal. Some Christians start steadfast in serving God, then experience some success in business, it lures them away. They forsake their pastor, their church, and more importantly, their God. To understand better what Demas did and to serve as a warning to all of us, let's look closely at this matter of loving the world. Somewhere along the line, Demas took his eyes off of the eternal and put it on the temporal. He replaced the love for the world that God had so that he can reach them. Why did Paul go through all of this that he went through? Because he was trying to reach the world with the same love that God had. Why was he going to lose his life? Because he was trying to love the world as God loved the world. And somewhere along the line, Demas had traveled with him. And Demas had been with him. And who knows what Demas was a witness to along the way. Somewhere he lost that love and was a place with, I love this world. Those who love the world do not have the love of the Father in them. Let me illustrate. Inside my heart is a love for God. I do not serve Him because my parents served Him. I do not serve Him because it is a popular or easy thing to do. I do not serve Him because I love the adventure or the risk of serving Him. I serve my Heavenly Father because in my heart is a love for Him. You better love God, not with lip service love, but with a heart love. You want to know who the next Demas is? You say it, but you don't have it here. Just as I would say that my wife's love is in my heart, I must have the love of God in my heart. If you love the world, it is because God's love is not in your heart. Christians don't like to hear this. It's Bible. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, that love is an important part of our service for God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The things in this world are not of the Father. John tells us, what these things are, meaning what are the things of this world. They can all put in these categories. They're the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things are not of God. If the lust of the flesh appeals to you, you're not committed to God. If the things that you see with your eyes appeal to you, you are not committed to God. And by the way, that's not just always sensual application. You can see somebody's lifestyle. You can see somebody's wealth. You can see somebody's standing. And if that has an appeal to you, you don't have the love. You don't have the love of you're not committed to God. If your heart is filled with pride for the things of this life, you are not committed to God. For, for someone, for a Christian to say, I'm going to do it because I want to do it, you, if, you talk, if you say, well, I really have a love for God, you are, you are talking out of both sides of your mouth. You're not being honest. You're lying to yourself. Because according to Scripture, you can't, it's, it's not the love of the Father. Beware of these three things because they are not of God. Be careful about what your flesh desires. Be careful what your eyes lead you to want. Be careful that you do not become enamored with what you can accomplish in this life. Those things are not of God. Well, if I didn't, if I didn't tithe, I could. You better be careful. If we weren't in a building program, I could. You better be careful. Well, and the young people may, may say something like this. Well, if I wasn't expected to, then I could. You better be careful. It's the love of God in our heart. The world passes, passes away in the lust thereof. I'll make this final point. The things that caused Demas to forsake Paul had no eternal value. When you get to heaven, you are not going to be acknowledged for how much money you made in this world. But you will be how much you gave to God. You get to heaven, you're not going to be acknowledged for any standing you made in this world, how many degrees you earned or what, what you had, but you will be acknowledged for what you did for Him. 
Everybody, everybody understand that that's how it's going to work? The things that caused Demas to forsake Paul, let this, let this sink in, had no eternal value. They would be gone when Demas died. We don't know the specific things that Demas left Paul for, having loved this present world. But we know it fits into those categories. Had to deal with the lust of the, of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He was going to go serve that. And when he died, is done. Demas gave up eternal rewards for temporary pleasure. Sometimes I, I scratch my head because sometimes I think some Christians think that they're actually going to get rewards in heaven for things that they're not going to get rewards in heaven because they've become such a priority in their life. Well, I just think that that's not really what the Bible says, and I think it's okay for a Christian to do this. You know, you, you know there's no loophole Christianity crown where you found the least holy way that you could live and meet God's standard. There's, there's, you can get a Burger King crown for that, but, you, but you, there's no eternal crown for that. Are, are you with me? Even as a, as a pastor, you look around and say, like, man, maybe if I, didn't, if, I, if I didn't troll the line, this and that. I'm not living for temporal. I'm not living for social media following, man's approval. I'm not living for, because there's an eternity. Demas, the moment he died, how many Christians who have been faithful, to, even in this church and churches like ours, for not just years but decades, and they got enamored by this world, and they forsook their pastor, they forsook those, they, 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 their soul-winning partner, they forsook their ministry, they forsook their spot in the choir, they forsook the, the, the kids that they taught in Sunday school, they forsook them for this world, for money, prestige, sin, they forsook them, and the moment they die, it's done. By the way, that gets here quicker than you think. Christians will often walk away from what counts and give the rest of their life to things that don't matter. I've seen preachers become enamored by wealth and trade the ministry for business. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Notice the comparison between Demas and Paul. Paul, was need, Paul needed Demas. Paul's coming to the end of his life. He mentions... And we'll look at it, Lord will, next week. As I've already mentioned, Luke is with me. But before he mentions the, the presence of Luke, he says, Demas hath forsaken me. We've seen in other instances that Demas was his companion. Demas left because he got enamored with the temporal, with this world. And when Demas died, it ended. And let's notice the comparison. Paul's going to lose his life. Maybe he even said, I, I'm going to go out there and get that while I can, and I ain't going to have to worry about that. Paul's going to lose his life. But notice what Paul writes just a little bit before he mentions, Demas hath forsaken me, in verse 8. Henceforth. Let's go back. To verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, because of, there's a laid up for me, hence there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but all of them that, are, that love his appearing. Demas gave up the eternal crown for a temporary pleasure. It's sad to see a child of God live for that which is temporary because of what it will do to them, but more than that, they give up the eternal. Demas could say, I ain't being beheaded. I'm not in jail. And it may seem like it's worth it at that moment, but the day is coming. As Paul writes, he knew, my life is short the time is short. My departure is imminent. It's going to take place. Will I have a hurt in my heart because I've been forsaken? Oh, the day's coming. 
it's going to be more than worth it all. Because there's a crown of righteousness. And it's not going to be distributed to me and those who are faithful by an angel. The righteous judge himself, my Savior, is going to present that crown to me. Friend, I can imagine what that might be like. None of us know what it's really going to be like. But I promise you this, that's better than the world's applause. That's better than a little more money in your bank account. That's better than being able to say, well, I did what I wanted to do. Friend, what, what a day that faithfulness, the Apostle Paul is going to receive that crown, whereas Demas had only a short time to enjoy the rewards. Paul would enjoy his for eternity. There's many applications. We can make this tonight, and I, and I wrap it up. You be faithful. Be faithful. Rewards are coming. You're not going to see them down here. The true influence of this church is not going to be seen by cathedrals that are built. It's not going to truly be seen by what, what man says. Eternity is going to determine And crowns are going to be given by Jesus Himself. And it's at that time, and before that time, but certainly at that time, is going to be worth what we called sacrifices. But when, can you imagine, the eyes of the Son of God lock with yours, and you bow before Him, you're at His feet, and He presents that crown of faithfulness, all the money in the world is not going to buy that. And if you had all the money in the world, you couldn't trade your regret for that. Demas is already sorry. He wasted. I'm thankful that no matter what you do as a Christian, if you're saved, you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. But it's a bad trade. Trade the world as Demas did for a crown. Only Luke is with me. Demas and Luke, I don't know if you were surprised by that. I didn't ever realize that, that we'll look next week, Lord willing. Of course, Luke is the author of the book of Luke, but there's two times Luke is mentioned. We saw him tonight. He's mentioned with Demas. One was faithful, one was unfaithful. The question is, which one are we going to be? Let's be, let's not be the deserter. Let's not be the one that's unfaithful. Much for us to learn and apply. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your church. Thank you for the word of God.